Welcome to Beat Diabetes. I'm Dennis Pollack and today I want to share a little information from the research and study of a company called Scripps Research. You can find their website, just Google Scripps, that's S-C-R-I-P-P-S, uh, ScrippsResearch.com. Uh, they've been using AI to try to predict who's going to end up diabetic. They look at healthy individuals that are not even pre-diabetic and then they look at pre-diabetics and what they're trying to figure out is what is it in someone that is going to indicate they're headed for real full-scale diabetes. So I want to just share a few of the thoughts that they uh, had to say in this article. They, uh, they came out with an article recently, just last month, and they talk about how they're now using AI and trying to add in lots of data to figure out who's headed for diabetes. And it's very enlightening. They, they said, we showed that two people that may have the same A1C uh, may have totally different indications as to whether they'll be diabetic or not. So you may have two people that are at a 5.5, non-diabetic, not pre-diabetic. But according to them and according to their model, one of them is headed for diabetes and the other may never see it at all. So interesting. Uh, they make this statement in their article, but in people at risk for diabetes, these spikes, talking about glucose spikes, can become sharper, more frequent, are slower to resolve even before routine lab tests like A1C pick up a problem. So I found that interesting. I'm all about glucose spikes. To me, the name of the game is taming those spikes. And uh, one of the things they're discovering and have discovered is that spikes tell the story. So I thought, well, while we're talking about spikes, let me show you three types of spikes that people get. One is the normal, when you're absolutely, completely healthy, no problems, young, slim, active, you eat healthy. You just have a little small spike. A rise in glucose? Yeah, but just a little small one, maybe up to 120, 125, 130, and then you're back down. And one of the things that fascinated me when I first heard it is that you're usually back down, for a healthy person, mind you, usually back down in 45 minutes time to an hour. So the idea of waiting until two hours, if you have to wait till two hours, before you get down to baseline level, that's not good. Some people, it may be longer than that. It may be three hours. It may be four hours. So that's, that's the healthy person. The person who's starting to have some issues, they're still going up and coming down pretty quickly. So that's a good thing, but they're going up too high. So instead of jumping up to 125 after a meal and then headed, heading back down, they're jumping up to 150, 175, 200 maybe even. And then they head down pretty quickly. Now, generally with this second spike, they are not going to have a, a, a very bad A1C. Their, their A1C may be in the normal range. Their fasting glucose will probably be in the normal range. So if they don't know anything about spikes and they never test their spikes to see how high they're going after meals, They'll never have a clue that they've morphed from the A spike, the absolute healthy spike, to the B spike, which is still better than the C spike, which is when you start approaching prediabetes or diabetes, or it just means you may not be too far away. And that is where you go up high, just like with the B spike, but you stay up a lot longer. So it may be three hours, whereas this individual they're back down relatively quickly. This individual goes as high or higher than Mr. B, but they stay up a while, sometimes quite a long while. So that's what you don't want. Well, that's what they were figuring out with some of their research and their AI model and putting the factors together. They identified that spikes are kind of like the big mama in terms of being able to predict who's headed for diabetes. They tested more than a thousand people in the U.S. They hooked them up to CGMs. They put all the data in computers and using AI, they figured out that the best way to tell if someone is headed for metabolic problems and all the complications that may come with diabetes is to see what their spikes look like. And the worse their spikes look, the more trouble is ahead.
They indicate in this article, uh, they say these words, one of the clearest signals of diabetes risk that the researchers found was the time it takes for a blood sugar spike to return to normal. So uh, in my thinking, there's two issues. Number one, how high does it go? And number two, how long does it stay up there? And they're like, just the fact that it takes a while to get back down is a real issue. And I would agree, uh, a healthy person is not going to take all that long. And, uh, you know, and I'll have to admit in my own experience, if I eat high carb, not only will I go up high, I will typically stay up a lot longer than Benedicta. And Benedicta is kind of like a great uh, example for me of what normal looks like, because she may go up a bit high, not as high as me, but then she won't even stay up there that long. So the, the final paragraph of this article says, ultimately, this is about giving people more insight and control. Diabetes doesn't just appear one day. It builds slowly, and we now have the tools to detect it earlier and intervene smarter. Well, you know, thank God for that. And yeah, the tools are coming, and the research is coming. And eventually, it's going to prove that you just can't overdose on carbohydrates if you've got metabolic problems. Maybe if you're young and healthy, you, you can get away with more. But chances are, once those spikes start coming, uh, you've got problems and you'd better intervene. I, I like the word intervene. What does intervene mean? It means you step into a situation where you're headed for disaster and you turn things around. It's kind of like if uh, a person is driving at night on a highway and there's a sign that says bridge out turn around but they ignore that they don't see the sign and then they go a little further and there's a police car with its lights on and they stop and the police says do you know that the bridge is out you're gonna have to turn around well they missed the sign but at least they saw the policeman so they managed to save their life so that's intervention you're not you're no longer going the way you were we need to intervene when we see these metabolic signs, uh, and some of them are actually diabetic complications. So as I said, Ben and I are kind of a good complement as to how someone who has diabetic tendencies can intervene in their own life. I can keep up with my wife, Benedicta, if we both eat low carb. I, I can almost do as well as her. Our blood sugar spikes are not much different when we eat low carb, but when we eat high carb, she does so much better than me. So the answer to me is simple. Don't eat high carb meals. Don't eat those donuts and all those sugary foods and all that bread and pasta and breakfast cereal and potatoes and rice and candy just and, and soda and fruit juice. Just skip all that and imitate your wife who does pretty well even if she cheats a little bit and eats some of those things. We don't eat, she doesn't eat nearly so much as a lot of people because she has to live with me and she's learned a few things. Uh, but spike control is the name of the game. But here's the thing, most people have no clue how they're spiking after meals. And then sometimes somebody will come along and say, well, spikes don't mean anything. Of course, your blood sugar is going to rise after a high carb meal. Everybody does. No, everybody doesn't do it the same way. If my blood sugar rose to 125 after a high carb meal, I'd be happy. But when it rises up to 185, 200, 225, that's not good at all. So you cannot say, and don't you dare say, everybody, everybody's glucose rises after a high carb meal. Well, the implication is it hardly matters how high you spike. It matters a great deal. And their AI little experiment is showing that people who are experiencing major spikes, spikes that go too high, spikes that don't go down very fast, they're the ones headed straight for diabetes. Spike control. In, in, in some ways, uh, I look at this little fellow as my spike control officer. He tells me how to control my glucose spikes. How does he tell me that? Well, I eat a meal that I, maybe I'm not sure about. And then after I finish that meal, I wait about an hour and 15 minutes and I test my blood sugar. And I ask 
little Mike, Mike the glucose meter, how high did we go? If he tells me, you went to 118, I'm like, well, I can eat that meal again. If he says, you went to 185, 200, 250, I'm like, boy, I can never eat that meal again. Not in that form. I may have to find an alternate, a substitute, whatever, but I sure can't eat that again. So he keeps me, <laughs> he keeps me doing well by letting me know what works and what doesn't. Now, one of the things that they say in this uh, article is uh, they emphasize that we need to be able to catch diabetes earlier and uh, be able to predict who's headed that way. And, and then we can make an intervention and be smart about how we change some things. Well, in a way, I would say absolutely amen to that. But let me say this. If you're having glucose spikes, you're already in the realm of diabetes, even though your A1C may not say so. If you're having major glucose spikes and they're not coming down very fast, I mean, you're, you're dealing with issues already. You're already harming your body. You may well have diabetic complications, even though your doctor says you're not diabetic. But when you test your glucose and find those spikes in what you're doing after a meal, and if it indicates there's an issue, it's time to intervene. Let me say it again, intervene into your life. That's what I had to do 20 some years ago when my blood sugar was bouncing all over the place and I could eat a high carb meal and jump up over 200. I had to intervene. And I've been living in that state of intervention ever since then. And I drove back the diabetic complications that were beginning to manifest themselves in my life. So it's kind of nice to know that AI from this research has figured out <laughs> something that little lowly Mike the glucose meter taught me a long time ago before anybody was ever talking about AI. And that is the name of the game is tame. <laughs> I like the little uh, rhyming words there. The name of the game is to tame those glucose spikes. I hope that this Beat Diabetes video has been a blessing to you. We're thrilled with every victory report about diabetes that we receive, but keep in mind that our primary ministry is teaching God's Word and lifting up the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We recently sponsored a mission in Kakamega, Kenya. As usual, the centerpiece of this mission was our Jesus Conference, which features 20 videos created by Benedict and me, aimed at pastors, teachers, evangelists, and church leaders, and focused on sharing the gospel of Jesus and abiding in Him personally. At the end of the conference, we award certificates for all who attend. This is more than just teaching, however. These four-day conferences are an event. We pay for meals for the participants, and we have breaks for tea and fellowship. We set aside discussion times after each study, where the attendees can ask questions and share insights they've gained. We also provide a free medical clinic for the area, which the Africans really appreciate. Many of them do not have access to doctors and clinics, and in some cases, they just can't afford medical help, even if there were a doctor nearby. And finally, we provide food for the local widows, who often do not have the job skills to get any kind of real work and struggle with hunger and lack constantly. It is your generosity that makes these conferences and outreaches possible. Please consider making a generous donation to Spirit of Grace Ministries. See the link in the description.